Let's take the Word of God, please, and uh, let's find the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel. And uh, if you're having trouble finding that, it'll be before 2 Samuel, all right? And uh, so 1 Samuel chapter number 1, if you will, please. And uh, let's stand together as we open God's Word together, and we'll read this uh, wonderful story. It's a wonderful story. And uh, today, of course, I wanted to, to speak in some way on uh, mothers, of course. Um, and today we find what I'm calling uh, a model mother in this passage, a model mother. First Samuel chapter number one, we come to the beginning of the life of Samuel and how he was born. First Samuel chapter number one, the Bible says in verse one, now there was a certain man of Ramatham Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. Now imagine being in that family. <laughs> and verse number two. And he had two wives, the name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. Now if you'll bear with me and bear together as we'll read this entire story and see what happens here. Verse number 10, And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought that she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up till the child is weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him, only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli, and she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, 
I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worship the Lord there. In order to get the whole import of the story, I had to read through that. I want you to see all this, how Samuel is prayed for, desired for, and then he's born, and then what's the response to that and what Hannah does at that point. And so today I want to speak on this, the model mother. And what we're going to learn from this, of course, won't be just for mothers, but it will be for all of us. Let's pray together, may we? Father, thank you for this uh, privilege to once again come together and open the Word of God and to see those whom you have placed strategically in your Word to teach us lessons and uh, to help us in our Christian life. And I pray that you would use it now. Use the message, Lord. Forgive us where we have failed you in our, in our words and our thoughts and actions. Forgive us. May we be fully given to thee in this time. May you speak to us, speak to our hearts, courage and strengthen and help. We thank you so much for your love and mercy in giving yourself for us. We, in response to that, we give this time to you and uh, speak to us as we uh, hear it. May we then respond to it and apply it and live it out in our lives. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. First Samuel chapter 1, uh, really this starts a new, a new era in the Israelites. Of course, uh, the Israelites were to be led by God. The Israelites were a theocracy. In other words, the God, God was leading them. And the law was given to Moses on Sinai, and Moses was the leader. Then that baton was passed down to Joshua. Joshua was the leader. And then apparently, and then eventually, the Israelites looked and said, We want a king. We want a king like all of the rest of the nations around us. We want a king. And uh, the Lord initially gave Samuel as a prophet but he was going to be the one to anoint the first king, Saul, and then, of course, David. And Samuel was going to be a great prophet, a great prophet in Israel. But we find here the story of Samuel's mother. We find how Samuel comes into the world. And I see some principles that Hannah, how she uh, lived out these principles in her own life. And that these are principles that no matter what stage in life, no matter who we are, man, woman, boy or girl, child, young person, that these principles, if we learn them early, if we learn them early and apply them to our lives, that it will help us tremendously. I see a model mother here, but I see someone who's a model for all. And her name's Hannah. She's the wife of Elkanah. She was not his only wife, but she was a wife that apparently he loved and, and, and gave more to her in some ways. But she was barren. Uh, she did not have any children for, for a long time. The Bible said the Lord had shut up her, her womb. In other words, the Lord had made it impossible at that time to have children. And the Bible says here in verse 6 that her adversary provoked her sore. And so Hannah had an adversary, and I believe as we read this, of course, the adversary was Penina. And of course, we have uh, truly what I see here with the husband and there's the two wives that actually were, were encroaching on what God actually intended to the, for the family anyway, and so we're having problems because of that. Things were not done the way they were initially intended to be, so we're, we're experiencing problems here. But Hannah, Hannah is the one that was loved, but Hannah was also loved of the Lord. And her adversary was the other, Penina, who had children. And we see this in other portions of Scripture also, a similar situation, where she became a grievance to Hannah. And the Bible says that this was happening year after year. So I want to give you some things, if you'll note these, please. Number one, if you'll notice, please, her adversary. We find Hannah. Hannah had an adversary. 
and his adversary provoked her sore, continued to provoke her as she went up to the temple of the Lord. Every year as they would go to offer the sacrifices as they were to do, there was one that was in the company, one with her that was an adversary to her. And what I say to you today, as we jump immediately to this application as it comes in, that all of us at one point or time or another in our lives will have adversaries. It's always going to be that way. There's going to be adversaries. Those whom we say provoke us sore. And this happens. This happens to Hannah. Now Hannah was a godly lady. She was one who I'm certain did not desire to be provoked, but was constantly bombarded by this stuff. And we know that we'll have adversaries. And I hope we won't be an adversary to someone else. But someone may be an adversary. Or it may be that someone in our life is just hard to deal with. Getting very, very uh, specific here, aren't we? Someone's just hard to deal with. We say it's not like I don't care about this person, but they're hard to deal with. There will always be those times. There will always be those people, those circumstances that we come across. We say it's very difficult. It's very difficult to deal with this. See things so differently. Uh, continually saying things that provoke and so on. And this, this happens, but I want you to see how Hannah responds. How Hannah deals with it. Sometimes people say, oh, this is going on, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to crack. Or I'm just going to scream. How many you heard that before? I'm just going to scream because I can't handle this anymore. But Hannah didn't scream. Hannah didn't crack. Hannah didn't fly off the handle. Hannah didn't say, look, maybe you have kids and I don't, but uh, you're no better than me. There's all kinds of things she could have said that perhaps would have been truthful. There's a problem with you. You're envious of what something I have. Or you don't have the walk with God that I have. But that wouldn't have been the right thing to do. That wouldn't have been the right response. I want you to see Hannah's response. What, what does Hannah do about this when she is provoked? Well, first thing that happened was she started crying about it. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It says she wept and did not eat. She said, I don't know what to do about this. And actually, I'm, I'm so down about this. I've been wanting something, asking for something for so long. And it hasn't happened. And I'm being constantly reminded. And, and, and my adversary is provoking me about this. And so she got to the point, she's crying and weeping and, and said, I'm not going to even eat right now. Let me do something else instead. So we learn what happens here. She wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, comes to her and says something that perhaps is, if I would be bold enough to say this, could have been somewhat insensitive. But he says, why are you not eating? Why are you grieving? Am I not better than ten sons? And I don't suggest ever talking that way to your wife, you know. But he says, why don't you, you know, what, what's the problem here? Why are we so down? And you know, I love you. But of course, she had another thing she was dealing with and uh, had the sorrow of spirit. So she rises up and, and at that moment, gets herself together, begins doing what they were to do, going to the temple, offering the sacrifice and so on. But then we come to verse number 10. And she was in bitterness of soul, bitterness of soul. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there before or not, and perhaps you have, where you felt you're in bitterness of soul. It's not just something where you feel as though you're, you're, you're sad or depressed or something or having a hard time, but in bitterness of soul. This is something that I'm feeling internally. This is something that's causing great bitterness. And by the way, this is not bitterness towards others. Hannah was not harboring bitterness in her heart towards Penina. See, that's the way we respond many times. Someone provokes us. Someone does things that we don't know what to do about it. 
And so we turn away from that person, and then we actually nourish a bitterness in our hearts toward that person. We begin to be angry at that person. We begin to think things and perhaps say things about that person because there's bitterness in our in us. But that's not the bitterness she had. She didn't have bitterness where she began to be angry at Penina, but bitterness of soul. This is an inward sorrow, an inward deep pain that she was experiencing. She didn't have bitterness towards her. She didn't rail on her. But what did she do? Notice in verse number 10, she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Notice number one, please, her adversary. Then notice number two, her prayer. So here, Hannah is being bombarded by her adversary who is saying these things, doing these things, poking at her, and Hannah does not respond with bitterness or rancor back towards her, but she goes to prayer. She goes to prayer. And she said, this is the only thing I can do. There's no other thing I can do right now. I'm not going to yell at her. I'm not going to say things I shouldn't say. I'm not going to say things about her. I could destroy her reputation, you know, if I were to talk about her, but she didn't do that. She went to prayer. She went to God. And when we are experiencing things that we don't know how to respond to or deal with, we go to the one who is the only one who can actually solve it. Because sometimes we can't solve it. We can't solve the problem. So I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But God can solve it. So we go to the one who can actually hear that prayer. And she goes to the Lord and she prays. This ought to be our response when when adversaries come our way, when things happen that are hurtful and do cause pain. We don't respond to that by reacting in anger and in fear and in bitterness, but instead in prayer. That's always a response. It's always a response. Prayer. So what did she do? Verse 11, she vowed a vow and she said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto me a man child. She's very specific. A man child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life and there shall no razor come upon him. So, The implication here is that she said, Lord, this is what I'm desiring with all my heart. This is what I'm praying for. And if you will remember me, if you will answer my prayer, then that gift that you will give me, I will give him to you for the rest of your life, of of his life. I will give him to you. If If this is what you give me as I've prayed for, I'm going to give it to you. She vows a vow. And, and the implication of the no razor on the head means he's going to be consecrated to you. Actually, this has the idea of the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow meaning a razor could never come on their head for the rest of their life. And she's literally saying that he will be living under a Nazarite vow. And so she goes to prayer and says, he will, if you will give me what I'm desiring, if you will give me a man-child, then I will dedicate him I will consecrate him for the rest of his life to you. And so she's praying there. We won't read the story again. But she's praying in her heart. She's praying in her heart. I want you to notice simple, three simple things about her prayer. First of all, we see it was a bitter prayer. It was a bitter prayer where she comes to the Lord, brings her complaint before the Lord, has that honest conversation, that honest prayer of the bitterness and the pain that was in her heart. It was a bitter prayer. Number two is a sincere prayer because she said, Lord, if you give me what I'm asking for, then I will give him back to you. It's a sincere prayer. But then thirdly, it's a heartfelt prayer. It's a heartfelt prayer where she says, she's praying not just with her her mouth and her words, but with her heart. It's a bitter prayer. It's a sincere prayer. It's a heartfelt prayer. 
And this should be all of our prayers. They should be sincere before the Lord and heartfelt. And she was praying in her heart, and as she's there, the Bible says that her mouth is moving, but there's nothing being heard because she's praying in her heart. And by the way, when you speak to the Lord, you don't have to speak the words. You can pray in your heart. You can pray to the Lord. You can pray to the Lord any time. And this sincere prayer is a heartfelt prayer. And the Bible says that Eli is there. All right, Eli's in his seat where he normally would be. He's in his seat and he looks and he sees a young lady praying. And he says, that's strange. And he looks over there at her and he says, she's, her mouth is moving. Now, I would think she was probably in a kneeling position or a praying position. He says, her mouth's moving. And so he presumes something. He says, well, certainly, if she is acting like this, she's drunk. This is what he thought. So he says, oh, woman, how long will you be using wine? And when will you put it away from you? And I see another thing about Hannah. Another thing about Hannah. You know, we could be on Hannah. We could talk about Hannah all day. Because another thing I see in this story that makes her a model for us is that when the priest said to her, how long will you be drunk? Hannah didn't rail on him and say, why would you assume that I'm drunk? Why would you assume this stuff about me? I'm just praying. But Hannah wasn't that type of person. She didn't respond to him that way. But instead she just said, Oh my Lord, I'm not drunk. But I am praying in the bitterness of my soul. I'm praying and I'm seeking the Lord. And you know what? She didn't respond the way she could have. You know what she could have said? Eli, why are you saying all this to me when your sons are at the door of the tabernacle committing illicit sin? Why are you saying this to me when your family is a mess? But she didn't do that. And what a model for us because her response was a simple, she, she told him, I'm not drunk, I am praying to the Lord. But in the right spirit, she had this right spirit. This is the kind of spirit she had. This spirit sustained her when Penina was throwing all the words at her and poking at her and, and annoying her and causing that bitterness. She didn't use the words then. She didn't use them with Eli. See, a lot of people, she could have said, look, everybody's against me. That's what she could have said, right? Everybody's against me. Why is everyone against me? Why is Penina against me? Why is the priest against me? Why is God against me? Because I haven't had any children. But that was not her spirit at all. She said, responds to Penina. She doesn't respond to that with bitterness, but she responds in prayer. When Eli said that to her, she didn't respond with anger. She wasn't just on the short fuse. Oh, I'm having a bad, hard time. I'm having a hard time because God hasn't been good to me. I'm having a hard time. She wasn't on a short fuse. But she had a good spirit when she responded to Eli. And she didn't blame God for it, but instead... In all of these situations, she responded in prayer. She responded in prayer. Now, prayer is the response that we need because we know God can do things beyond our abilities, beyond what we can do. And He can answer the prayer. So it was a bitter prayer. It was a sincere prayer. It was a heartfelt prayer. And so when she, comes, when she says to Eli, I'm in this complaint and grief. That complaint, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with going to the Lord and complaining in that sense and grieving. But she said, that has drawn me to prayer. The complaint and the grief. I brought it to the Lord. We want to bring it to everybody else. We want to bring it to everybody else. All the complaints and the problems we have. But she went to the Lord and she spoke to the Lord about her petition. So number one, we see here her adversary. We see her prayer. But then thirdly, if you'll notice with me, please, we see her faith. We see her faith. The Bible says in verse number 18, And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace 
in thy sight. Now she's speaking to Eli. Let thine hand may find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Now how did this happen? Because Eli, when he was spoken to her, he said, young lady, may God grant you the petition that you desire. And in her heart, after she had prayed, her heart was flooded with peace, knowing that I know God will answer. God will answer one way or another. Why does it say her countenance was no more sad? It was no more sad because she knew God will take care of this. I can trust God. I can trust God. And so when we go to prayer, we should be going not with just this monologue of, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray. But I'm going to pray and let God and, and believe God that He will answer. And then following up that prayer should be the faith, knowing that I have given my petition to God. I have prayed. And so now I can know that God will take it into His hand. And then we can go away from that no more sad. Go away from that no more sad. We spend our whole lives sometimes in sadness because we don't pray. We don't bring it to God. We bear it all alone. But the Lord wants to bear it as we cast our burdens at His feet. We cast our cares on Him knowing He cares for us. And when we cast it on to Him and we come to Him and give Him our petitions, we can walk away from it no more sad because we know that He hears that He answers in His time. And so, we see Hannah's faith. Hannah's faith. Immediately after that, we see Elkanah and Hannah, they worship the Lord. And that's a great response. They begin worshiping the Lord, um, believing and trusting that God would answer the prayer. Eli's worshiping, trusting God will answer. So the Lord remembers her, and the Bible tells us she has a child. As the Lord, I believe, in, in that sense, and He was promising her that as she spoke there with the priest, and he says, The Lord grant thee the petition that you have desired. And they have a son and call him Samuel. And Samuel means, I asked him of the Lord. I asked the Lord for him, uh, for a man child, and the Lord gave it to me. And then as Elkanah is going back and the family goes to bring the sacrifices year after year, you might say, well, why was it? Why was it that she stayed home and had to wait till the child was weaned before she could bring the child? Because she said, I'm going to wait until the child's weaned because then at that point when the, when the child is weaned, then I will be able to take him, now watch this, then I will be able to take him to the temple and leave him there and he'll remain there for the rest of his life. So I want to wait till he's old enough so that I can give him to God and I know that he now belongs to the Lord and this was a child God gave her. And she said, he will now be given unto the Lord for the rest of his life. And so the child there, Samuel, she said, he's the one I asked for of the Lord. And that's her prayer. That's her prayer. And the faith became sight because she believed the Lord. And so as we think about this, and we think about the faith that Hannah had, the Bible tells us in verse number 23, Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, and tarry until they have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. And by the way, you always know the Lord will establish his word. The Lord will always do what he said. And he may not do what you think he's going to do or desire him to do every time, but you know that he will do what's right. He know, you know that he will do that which is right. So she brings him to Shiloh uh, eventually when he's weaned, and the Bible says in verse 24 that he was young. And by the way, it's very important to understand that the younger child is, that's when they need to be given to God. That's when they need to be given to God. And that's when they need to come to, to the Lord. And that we want to teach them and help them to do that, to come to the Lord. Think about how Psalms tells us, Satisfy me early with thy mercy, that I can rejoice and be glad all my days. A child at the young age needs to be given to God. And you know, we can do that. We can give our children to, to the Lord and dedicate them that way. We can't control the way that person lives their lives. Um, but in our hearts and in our minds, we can, we can dedicate, we can yield, we can say, for this child I prayed, and 
he belongs to God for God to do with that child what he sees fit. And so Elkanah okay, said, The Lord, only the Lord establishes his word. She comes and brings him when he's yet young to the temple. They offer the offerings. And she comes in and sees Eli. And there he is again. Eli's in his place. She says, Oh, my Lord, I'm the woman that you accused of being drunk, right? No, she didn't say that. I'm the woman that you saw praying for a child. And here he is. God has answered. God has provided what I asked for. And this is a child, and, and certainly she comes to Eli and says, we're going to give him to the Lord. And so there was faith involved in this. There's faith involved. Hannah had an adversary. She went to prayer. And that was a prayer of faith. And then I want you to notice the last thing here. She says to Eli, this is a child that I prayed for, for this child, verse 22, for this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me the petition that I asked of him. Then notice number four, please. We see the vow. Her adversary, her prayer, her faith, and then we see her vow. She makes a vow to the Lord, and actually what she's doing here is fulfilling the vow that she had already made. Because she made a vow when before the child was ever born. Before the child was ever born, she said, I'm going to give this child to God. Verse 28, Therefore, says Hannah, Therefore also I have lent. Now we'll stop there for a moment. I have. I've already done it, right? It's not that I'm just dedicating him right now as I hold him in my arms in front of the pre, you know, here at the temple, whatever. It's not that I'm just dedicating him now, right now, but I have already. Because I made a vow that if God would answer my prayer, that gift would be given to God for the rest of his life. So therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. She's thinking about Samuel. He's the one I prayed for. Now that God has given him to me, I will give him to God. I will lend him. He's just a gift. I will give him back. And he will belong to the Lord. This was the vow. You know, many times as we come to the Lord in prayer, you know, there's nothing in, in any way wrong with praying, Lord, if you'll answer this prayer, I will do this. Nothing wrong with that. I have. Lord, if you'll do this that I'm requesting, the petition that I have, I will give this to you. I will respond to it in this way. I will give it. I will dedicate it to you for the rest of my life, the rest of his life. And Samuel became that prophet in Israel who, as we mentioned this morning, he anointed Saul with the horn of oil, and then he anoints David with the horn of oil. Samuel is used mightily of God. Samuel is mentioned throughout the Bible, all the way to Hebrews 11. Samuel and the prophets, the Bible says. Samuel was given to God, and at a young age, I'm almost finished here, as we'll, I want your attention as we bring this together. He says, at a, and then at a young age, Samuel is there, he's in the temple of God. Remember the story? How he's in the temple of God, and he's laying down, and he says, Samuel, he hears Samuel. Yes, Eli, did you call me? He runs to Eli. Eli, did you call me? He says, no, young man, go back to bed. I didn't call you. He goes back to bed. Samuel. He runs back to Eli. Eli, did you call me? No, go back to bed. He goes back to bed. Samuel. Does the same thing again. Three times. And then Eli no matter how impoverished he was in some ways, and there was, there was prophecy against him because of his sons and all that, but Eli was still the priest. And Eli perceived 
God's trying to speak to this young man. God's trying to speak to him. And he says, Samuel, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to bed. I want you to lay down. And when you hear that voice again, I want you to say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. He goes back to bed. Samuel, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And that's when the Lord called Samuel and actually gave him that prophecy and said, I want you to go back to Eli and tell him this and this and this and this and this. It was a very hard prophecy to give. And in the morning, he gets up, he said, and Eli looks at Samuel and says, Can you tell me what happened last night? Tell me every whit, he says. Don't leave one bit of it out. You know, I have an inkling in my mind that he knew something was, something was a little off, that he was going to hear something he didn't want to hear. He says, tell me every whit. He said, the Lord do so to you and more also if you leave one itty-bitty thing out of this. And Samuel tells him the whole thing. This is exactly what God said. It's a prophecy against you. And Eli just responds and says, the Lord do, do as he seems good to his, in his sight. The Lord will do as he seems good. Samuel was mightily used of God. And God took his life and used it. And let me just suggest to you today, in closing, I want you to hear this, that Samuel could not have been used by God the way he was if he had not been first given to God by his mother. She gave him to God, and there's a young boy in the temple. God calls him. Because she'd already given him. It said he's going to stay here. He's going to live here. He lived there. And that's where God called him. You know, I was a young man when God called me. I was 17 years old when the Lord called me to serve him. But he's a lot younger than that. He's a young boy, and God called him. And by the way, if you're a young person, you're a young boy, young girl, God can use you. God can use you. And God wants to get a hold of your life right now. God wants to speak to you. God wants to use your life as a young person. Just like He took Samuel's life and used it, God wants to use your life. As the Lord speaks to you, yield to Him. Say, Lord, I want you to use me. I want you to use me. So Hannah... She has an adversary. What does she do? She goes to prayer. That's her response. That every time she went to prayer. She had faith in that prayer, and then she made the vow, and she fulfilled the vow, said, God, if you want to answer this, then I'll give him to you for the rest of his life. And what I see here is a model mother. I see that not only for mothers to emulate, not just for mothers to try to live this way, but these principles of giving back to God, and these principles of faith, and these principles of prayer when we experience those adversaries. Going to prayer, not responding in another way, but all these things is the way that we ought to live. God will use that. Let's pray together, may we?